Hello everyone, this is Ben Schrader. I am a front-end developer on the Realtime GIS team. And I'm Cody Lawson. I'm a front-end and user experience developer. And today we're going to talk about ArcGIS analytics for IoT, specifically the front-end and how we built it. So ArcGIS Analytics for IoT is the latest offering from Esri focused on allowing users to ingest, visualize, and analyze real-time and big data. If you watch the Dev Summit Plenary, you know that real-time and big data analysis is something our industry is thinking about, and solutions for working with large amounts of data are in demand. Not only have we developed a dynamic and powerful platform for working with data, but thanks to its role as an ArcGIS online product, this solution fits comfortably with your organization's existing GIS infrastructure and requires no knowledge of big data storage or cloud management. This balance between user friendliness and high capability is central to the way we've crafted this application's architecture. There are three main layers we consider part of the ArcGIS analytics for IoT solution a backend application, a front-end web application, and a REST API layer to seamlessly allow them to communicate. As front-end developers, we wanted to create a user interface that exposed the power of analytics for IoT in a way that users would find comfortable and pleasant to use. Distilling what is a complex solution into a solid user experience required considering a lot of factors and is the primary subject of this presentation. Finally, before we continue, uh, it's also worth emphasizing that this product is available now. We won't be discussing the product from a business perspective, but if you think analytics for IoT is something your organization could leverage, please reach out to your Esri salesperson for more information. So to jump into the tech stack, you can see that we're using React and Redux. And along with React and Redux, we're using an architecture called a duck, which is basically a pattern on how to organize your Redux uh, into more bite-sized chunks so that all of your reducers, actions, and operations are co-located together so that it kind of bundles all the functionality for a specific component or part of your Redux state together. Uh, if you don't know what Redux is, it's a way to manage global state for your entire application. Uh, so this makes it very easy to uh, store variables or request uh, different pieces of information from different APIs and store that all in one place so that several components can all access that data very easily. Um, we're also using Thunk, which allows us to asynchronously uh, make calls to those APIs and store that in Redux, which would normally be a little bit more complicated. And this kind of simplifies that using Thunk. Uh, another way to kind of reach into our Redux store and access that information is with a library called Reselect. And so this allows us to uh, kind of pull data from, re from our Redux store in a way that's very useful for the front end components. So this allows us uh, to store data in Redux in a way that very much mimics how the data is coming in from different APIs. And so we're not doing the transformation on that data, data there, only doing the transformation once we're using that data on the front end. And these reselect functions are actually memoized. So they're only gonna be running once the actual arguments to that function are changed. So this makes it very efficient to do uh, more complex um, calculations on that data and transformations and have confidence that it's not going to slow down our application. Along with Redux and React, we're also, so another key feature is React IATN next. And this uh, is for internationalization. And so this is a very much a key part of supporting this product um, in the larger ecosystem of Esri products. Uh, and so we're able to support 39 languages um, as well as uh, locales so we can display numbers and dates in a way that makes sense for various locations. So even though you know English in America uh, shows dates in one way, uh, English in other regions will show dates in other ways. So this allows us to kind of support that as well. Uh, and we're, we're working extensively, extensively with the uh, internationalization team to make sure that this is all handled uh, very easily for, for users as they're logged in with their online credentials. Um, early on, we decided that we were going to need a component library to kind of deal with writing the front end and UI of the application. And so we decided to make Calcite React for ourselves. And so this allows us to uh, create components and um, interact with UI elements in a way that's uh, very similar to other React components. 
rather than something that is a little bit harder to deal with sometimes, which is CSS uh, in very large applications. Uh, so this allows us to kind of abstract those styles um, into their own components. And so we're using styled components, which is a library that helps you kind of bundle these things and create components. And it allows you to take properties instead of just, you know, juggling CSS classes in your application. So you can really just like deal with these components uh, as a normal React component. Um, and so this allows us to like easily adhere to Esri's brand guideline, uh, which has been around for a while and uh, has been uh, developed in multiple ways. But this is this was the first one that was developed specifically for React. Um, and now that we've kind of uh, finished developing this, it's actually been used by several other products within Esri. And uh, because it's themable, it allows people to change colors and other variables uh, in their application, including uh, font face and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this has been integral for us to be able to build our application very rapidly as we continue. Now, Analytics for IoT is an ArcGIS product. Specifically, it's one hosted on ArcGIS Online. On the right, you can see Analytics for IoT in the App Launcher alongside all the other applications your organization already uses. However, being an ArcGIS product has a couple of implications we had to consider as part of this effort. The first is brand identity. Users should know that they're using an ArcGIS product. As Cody already discussed, we utilize Calcite React to remove a lot of the obstacles uh, to achieve that. He also discussed internationalization and localization. So while it's a good idea to be cognizant of both when developing any web application, it's even more important when developing for a platform already known for robust internationalization support. Everything from text prompts to date fields to number inputs are aware of your ArcGIS online language and culture settings, and this is something that we will be continuing to expand on in future releases. We want to make sure that the developers involved in the ArcGIS REST.js project get the kudos they deserve as well. Uh, ArcGIS REST.js is an open source JavaScript library that makes working with the ArcGIS REST API seamless, both sending requests and then working with the data that those requests give our app. We use this library everywhere in our app from when we read your user profile to determine what language uh, you're using uh, to what cloud region is tied to your organization's ArcGIS analytics for IoT subscription. Our application's unique requirements have also helped shape enhancements to the ArcGIS REST.js library. So for instance, there's a new subscription info call uh, in the latest version of ArcGIS Online's REST API, and our application is among the first to use that call. So working with the ArcGIS REST.js team, we were able to get that included in their code base and make sure that that project stays as comprehensive uh, as possible. And last but not least, we should touch on every web developer's favorite subject, which is authentication. Without getting into the weeds too much, ArcGIS Online has pretty well documented login flows for interacting with secured resources, and the aforementioned ArcGIS REST.js um, helps a lot in simplifying that process for us even more. Organization administrators are also provided with additional functionality to manage all of their analytics for IoT items within their organization. One sort of unique facet about analytics for IoT is the fact that users will have feeds and analytic tasks that need to run constantly, constantly as in 24 seven for years at a time without interruption. Again, for the sake of brevity, I won't focus on this too much, but analytics for IoT has developed a custom solution uh, wherein our backend application utilizes refresh tokens to make sure that no piece of data goes unaccounted for because of authentication issues. Now, while we've created a product that we are incredibly proud of, we're also constantly asking ourselves how we can continue to improve the front end of this application. Part of the reason we aim to architect our application in a sustainable way is to lower the barrier to future enhancements as we receive customer feedback and the business needs of the product change. So what's on our radar? You already know that the front end is based on React, but it was architected before some of today's advancements in the React API became commonplace. We'd like to begin using hooks in lieu of class components where it makes sense to. The nice thing about this is that it can happen gradually. Hooks have definitely proven themselves to not be a gimmick, and it does seem that the React ecosystem is adopting them in full force. Additionally, we'd like to start taking advantage of the context API to remove some pretty uh, epic prop drilling in our app. There are a few extreme cases where, for instance, a prop is being passed down five or maybe six components deep, and we want to avoid that, of course, if at all possible. 
Like hooks, TypeScript is a technology that is both in vogue and easy to adapt incrementally. Unlike hooks, however, TypeScript has a few pain points as we explore the best way to balance TypeScript compilation with our third-party libraries such as React, CalSite React, and the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Finally, whenever we introduce uh, customers to analytics for IoT for the first time, we often get the same question, which is, can I use this in ArcGIS Enterprise the same way I use GeoEvent Server? While we can't speak to any concrete plans to adapt analytics for IoT to an enterprise environment, we're always thinking about how such an implementation would look. From a front-end perspective, much of the burden is alleviated by the fact that the ArcGIS REST API is largely identical between ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise, so any logic surrounding our network requests would ideally change very little. Other parts of our app, such as how we handle authentication, cloud provider configuration, and even our capacity to support disconnected environments would require pretty substantial enhancement work. We want our roadmap to be informed both by code-related concerns like these and the feedback we receive from customers as we begin integrating analytics for IoT into their WebGIS workflows. These are a few key areas of focus, but we know that it's important to remain adaptable and open to new technologies as they emerge. And as most of you know, in the front-end development world, they do emerge fast. So that's a quick sneak peek into our development process. I hope we've provided some context on how a new Esri product is developed and technologies used to make it fast and sustainable well into the future. And we look forward to seeing how our customers will use the application to develop workflows and analytics that we've yet to imagine. Thanks. Mm -hmm.